Once again, it is Black Clock Audio Tales. We are in our final week of Edgar Allan Poe in the final week of January. Ooh. Check out our schedule in the show notes to find out what next month will be for Black Clock Audio Tales and People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Also check out Articulate Warbling with Zach Ferguson and also Dave's Corner of the Universe and Dave's Underground Goat Shenanigans, which will be coming out by the end of this month. So, hey, check out that, wait for that, look for that. Here we go, Edgar Allan Poe, Volume 5 of Collected Works of Edgar Allan Poe, The Raven. This episode is bought, brought to you by bunnyslippers.com. Keep your feet warm, don't get cold. Bunny slippers, dino sound slippers, s'more slippers, sports slippers, sci-fi, fantasy, cute critters, all kinds of cool stuff. And don't forget about found item clothing, cool shirts from your favorite cult films from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. You want to dress like Booger? You want to dress like Styles from Teen Wolf and wear a t-shirt that says, what are you looking at? Dino's? You can do that. Found item clothing. And remember, check us out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, And pgttcm.com, look for us, pgttcm.com, Black Clock Audio Tales, and here you go with Edgar Allan Poe. All right, let's start. Recording by Antonio Barroso. To Helen by Edgar Allan Poe. Helen, thy beauty is to me like those Nicene barks of yore, that gently o'er a perfumed sea the weary, way-worn wanderer bore to his own native shore. On desperate seas long wont to roam, thy hyacinth hair, thy classic face, thy naiad airs have brought me home to the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome. Lo, in yon brilliant window niche, how statue-like I, me, thee stand, the agate lamp within thy hand. Ah, Psyche, from the regions which are holy land. End of section 47. Also, the Valley of Unrest by Edgar Allan Poe. Once it smiled a silent dell, where the people did not dwell. They had gone unto the wars, trusting to the mild-eyed stars, nightly, from their azure towers, to keep watch above the flowers, in the midst of which all day the red sunlight lazily lay. Now each visitor shall confess the sad valley's restlessness. Nothing there is motionless, Nothing save the airs that brood over the magic solitude. Ah, by no wind are stirred those trees that palpitate like the chill seas around the misty Hebrides. Ah, by no wind those clouds are driven that rustle through the unquiet heaven uneasily from morn till even. Over the violets there that lie in myriad types of the human eye, over the lilies there that wave and weep above a nameless grave. They wave from out their fragrant tops, eternal dews come down in drops. They weep from off their delicate stems, perennial tears descend in gems. End of section 48. Antonio Barroso, Israfel, by Edgar Allan Poe. And the angel Israfel, whose heart strings are a lute, and who has the sweetest voice of all God's creatures. Quran. In heaven a spirit doth dwell, whose heart strings are a lute. None sing so wildly well as the angel Israfel, and the giddy stars so legends tell. Ceasing their hymns, attend the spell of his voice, all mute. Tottering above, 
In her highest noon, the enamored moon blushes with love, while to listen, the red leaven, with the rapid pleiads even, which were seven, pauses in heaven, and they say, the starry choir and all the listening things, that Israfeli's fire is owing to that lyre by which he sits and sings, the trembling living wire of those unusual strings. But the skies that angel trod, where deep thoughts are a duty, where love's a grown-up god, where the hoary glances are imbued with all the beauty which we worship in a star. Therefore thou art not wrong, Israfeli, who despisest an unimpassioned song. To thee the laurels belong, best bard, because the wisest. Merrily live and long. The ecstasies above with thy burning measures suit. Thy grief, thy joy, thy hate, thy love, with the fervor of thy lute. Well may the stars be mute. Yes, heaven is thine, but this is a world of sweets and sours. Our flowers are merely flowers, and the shadow of thy perfect bliss is the sunshine of ours. If I could dwell where Israfel hath dwelt, and he where I, he might not sing so wildly well a mortal melody, while a bolder note than this might swell from my lyre within the sky. End of section 49. by Edgar Allan Poe. 1. The bowers whereat, in dreams, I see the wantonest singing birds are lips, and all thy melody of lip-begotten words. 2. Thine eyes, in heaven of heart enshrined, then desolately fall, O oh God, on my funeral mind like starlight on a pall. 3. Thy heart, thy heart, I wake and sigh, and sleep to dream till day of truth that gold can never buy, of the trifles that it may. End of section 50 Recording by Sean Daly To Blank by Edgar Allan Poe I heed not that my earthly lot hath little of earth in it, that years of love have been forgot in the hatred of a minute. I mourn not that the desolate are happier sweet than I, but that you sorrow for my fate, who am a passer-by. End of section 51 Recording by Florence Short To the River Blank Fair river, in thy bright clear flow of crystal wandering water, thou art an emblem of the glow of beauty, the unhidden heart, the playful maziness of art in old Alberto's daughter. But when within thy wave she looks, which glistens then and trembles, why then the prettiness of brooks her worshipper resembles. For in my heart, as in thy stream, her image deeply lies, his heart which trembles at the beam of her soul-searching eyes. End of section 52. Recording by Maria Simsham. Sung by Edgar Allan Poe. I saw thee on thy bridal day, when a burning blush came over thee. The happiness around thee lay, the world of love before thee, and in thine eye a kindly light. Whatever it might be, was all on earth my aching sight of loveliness could see. That blush perhaps was made in shame, as such it well may pass, though its glow hath raised a fiercer flame in the breast of him, alas, who saw thee on that bridal day, when that deep blush would come over thee, the happiness around thee lay, the world of love before thee. End of section 53 Spirits of the Dead by Edgar Allan Poe Thy soul shall find itself alone Mid dark thoughts of grey tombstone, Not one of all the crowd to pry Into thine hour of secrecy. 
Be silent in that solitude, which is not loneliness, for then the spirits of the dead who stood in life before thee are again in death around thee, and their will shall then overshadow thee. Be still. For night, though clear, shall frown, and the stars shall look not down from their high thrones in the heaven, with light like hope to mortals given. But their red orbs, without beam, to thy weariness shall seem as a burning and a fever which could cling to thee forever. Now our thoughts thou shalt not banish, now our visions ne'er to vanish, for thy spirit shall they pass no more like dewdrop from the grass. The breeze, the breath of God, is still, and the mist upon the hill, shadowy, shadowy yet unbroken, is a symbol and a token, how it hangs upon the trees, a mystery of mysteries. End of section 54. by Larry Wilson A Dream by Edgar Allan Poe In visions of the dark night I have dreamed of joy departed, but a waking dream of life and light hath left me broken-hearted. Ah, what is not a dream by day to him whose eyes are cast on things around him with a ray turned back upon the past? That holy dream that holy dream while all the world were chiding hath cheered me as a lovely beam a lonely spirit guiding what through that light through storm and night so trembled from afar what could there be more purely bright in truth's day star eighteen twenty seven end of section fifty five reading by larry wilson Romance by Edgar Allan Poe Romance, who loves to nod and sing With drowsy head and folded wing Among the green leaves as they shake Far down within some shadowy lake To me a painted paraquet hath been A most familiar bird Taught me my alphabet to say To lisp my very earliest word While in the wild wood I did lie A child with a most knowing eye of late eternal condor years so oh, shake the very heaven on high with tumult as they thunder by i have no time for idle cares through gazing on the unquiet sky and when an hour with calmer wings its down upon thy spirit flings that little time with lyre and rhyme to while away forbidden things my heart would feel to be a crime unless it trembled with the strings. 1829 End of section 56 Fairyland by Edgar Allan Poe Dim veils and shadowy floods And cloudy-looking woods Whose forms we can't discover For the tears that drip all over Huge moons there wax and wane, again, 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 every moment of the night, forever changing places, and they put out the starlight with the breath from their pale faces. About twelve by the moon dial, one more filmy than the rest, a kind which upon trial they have found to be the best, comes down, still down, and down, with its center on the crown of a mountain's eminence while its wide circumference in easy drapery falls over hamlets, over halls, wherever they may be, o'er the strange woods, o'er the sea, over the spirits on the wing, over every drowsy thing, and buries them up quite in a labyrinth of light. And then, how deep, oh deep is the passion of their sleep! In the morning they arise, and their moony covering is soaring in the skies with the tempests as they toss, like almost anything, or a yellow albatross. They use that moon no more for the same end as before. The delicate attempt, which I think extravagant, its atomies, however, into a shower dissever, of which those butterflies of earth who seek the skies, and so come down again, 
never contented things have brought a specimen upon their quivering wings 1831 end of section 57 by edgar allan poe in spring of youth it was my lot to haunt of the wide earth a spot to which i could not love the less so lovely was the loneliness of a wild lake with black rock bound and the tall pines that towered around but when the night had thrown her pall upon that spot as upon all and the mystic wind went by murmuring in melody then ah then i would awake to the terror of the lone lake yet that terror was not fright but a tremulous delight a feeling not the jeweled mind could teach or bribe me to define nor love although the love were thine death was in that poisonous wave and in its gulf a fitting grave for him who thence could solace bring to his lonely imagining whose solitary soul could make an eden of that dim lake 1827 end of section 58 Recording by Richie Franklin, Salt Lake City, Utah. Evening Star by Edgar Allan Poe. Twas noontide of summer, and midtime of night, and stars in their orbits shone pale through the light of the brighter cold moon. Mid planets her slaves, herself in the heavens, her beam on the waves. I gazed a while on her cold smile, too cold, too cold for me. There passed, as a shroud, a fleecy cloud, and I turned away to thee. Proud evening star, in thy glory afar, and dearer thy beam shall be. For joy to my heart is the proud part thou bearest in heaven at night, and more I admire thy distant fire than that colder, lowly light. End of section 59. Harry Wilson. The Happiest Day by Edgar Allan Poe. The happiest day, the happiest hour my seared and blighted heart hath known, the highest hope of pride and power I feel hath flown. Of power, said I, yes, such I ween, but they have vanished long, alas. The visions of my youth have been, but let them pass. And pride, what have I now with thee? Another brow may even inherit the venom thou hast poured on me. Be still, my spirit. The happiest day, the happiest hour mine eyes shall see, have ever seen the brightest glance of pride and power I feel have been. But were that hope of pride and power now offered with the pain, even then I felt, that brightest hour I would not live again. For on its wing was dark alloy, and as it fluttered, fell an essence powerful to destroy a soul that knew it well. 1827 End of section 60 Edgar Allan Poe A dark, unfathomed tide of interminable pride, a mystery and a dream should my early life seem. I say that dream was fraught with a wild and waking thought of beings that have been, which my spirit hath not seen had I let them pass me by with a dreaming eye. Let none of earth inherit that vision on my spirit, whose thoughts I would control as a spell upon my soul, for that bright hope at last and that light time have passed, and my worldly rest hath gone with a sigh as it passed on. I care not though it perish, with a thought I then did cherish. 1827 End of section 61 Recording by Richie Franklin, Salt Lake City, Utah Yes, by Edgar Allan Poe Translation from the Greek 1. Wreathed in myrtle, my sword I'll conceal like those champions devoted and brave, when they plunged in the tyrant their steel, and to Athens deliverance gave. 2. Beloved heroes, your deathless souls roam in the joy-breathing isles of the blest, where the mighty of old have their home, where Achilles and Diomed rest. 3. 
In fresh myrtle my blade I'll entwine, like Harmodius the gallant and good, when he made at the tutelar shrine a libation of tyranny's blood. 4. Ye deliverers of Athens from shame, ye avengers of liberty's wrongs, endless ages shall cherish your fame, embalmed in their echoing songs. 1827. End of section 62. Recording by Richie Franklin, Salt Lake City, Utah. Shemp. Dreams by Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, that my young life were a lasting dream, my spirit not awakening till the beam of an eternity should bring the morrow. Yes, though that long dream were of hopeless sorrow, twere better than the dull reality of waking life to him whose heart shall be, and hath been ever, on the chilly earth, a chaos of deep passion from his birth. But should it be that dream eternally continuing, as dreams have been to me in my young boyhood, should it thus be given, twere folly still to hope for higher heaven. For I have reveled when the sun was bright in the summer sky, in dreamy fields of light, and left unheedingly my very heart in climes of mine imagining, apart from mine own home, with beings that have been of mine own thought. What more could I have seen? T'was once and only once, and the wild hour from my remembrance shall not pass. Some power or spell had bound me. T'was the chilly wind came o'er me in the night, and left behind its image on my spirit. Or the moon shone on my slumbers in her lofty noon too coldly. Or the stars, howe'er it was, that dream was as the night wind. Let it pass. I have been happy though but in a dream. I have been happy, and I love the theme. Dreams, in their vivid coloring of life, as in that fleeting shadowy misty strife of semblance with reality which brings to the delirious eye more lovely things of paradise and love, and all our own, than young hope in its sunniest hour hath known. End of section 63 In Youth I Have Known One by Edgar Allan Poe How often we forget all time when lone, admiring nature's universal throne, her woods, her wilds, her mountains, the intense reply of hers to our intelligence. 1. In youth I have known one with whom the earth in secret communing held is he with it, in daylight, and in beauty from his birth whose fervid flickering torch of life was lit from the sun and stars, whence he had drawn forth a passionate light such for his spirit was fit, and yet that spirit knew, not in the hour of its own fervor, what had o'er it power. 2. Perhaps it may be that my mind is wrought to a fever by the moonbeam that hangs o'er, but I will half believe that wild light fraught with more of sovereignty than ancient lore hath ever told. Or is it of a thought the unembodied essence, and no more that with a quickening spell doth o'er us pass as dew of the night-time, or the summer grass? 3. Doth o'er us pass when as the expanding eye to the loved object, so the tear to the lid will start, which lately slept in apathy? And yet it need not be, that object hid from us in life, but common which doth lie each hour before us, but then only bid with a strange sound, as of a harp-string broken, to awake us, tis a symbol and a token. 4. Of what in other worlds shall be, and given in beauty by our God, to those alone who otherwise would fall from life in heaven, drawn by their heart's passion, and that tone, that high tone of the spirit which hath striven, though not with faith, with godliness, whose throne with desperate energy it hath beaten down, wearing its own deep feeling as a crown. End of section 64. Morning by Sean Daly. A Pean by Edgar Allan Poe. How shall the burial rite be read, the solemn song be sung, the requiem for the loveliest dead that ever died so young? Her friends are gazing on her, and on her gaudy bier, and weep, oh, to dishonor, dead beauty with a tear. 
They loved her for her wealth, and they hated her for her pride. But she grew in feeble health, and they love her that she died. They tell me, while they speak of her costly broidered pall, that my voice is growing weak, that I should not sing at all, or that my tone should be tuned to such solemn song, so mournfully, so mournfully, that the dead may feel no wrong. But she is gone above, with young hope at her side, and I am drunk with love of the dead who is my bride. Of the dead, dead who lies all perfume there, with the death upon her eyes, and the life upon her hair. Thus on the coffin loud and long I strike, the murmur sent through the grey chambers to my song shall be the accompaniment. Thou diedst in thy life's June, but thou didst not die too fair, thou didst not die too soon, nor with too common air. For more than fiends on earth, thy life and love are riven, to join the untainted mirth of more than thrones in heaven. Therefore to thee this night I will no requiem raise, but waft thee on thy flight with a paean of old days. End of section 65I could not awaken my heart to joy at the same tone, and oh, I laughed, I laughed alone. Then, in my childhood, in the dawn of the most stormy life, was drawn from every depth of good and ill the mystery which bends me still. From the torrent or the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rode in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by, from the thunder and the storm and the cloud that took the form when the rest of the heaven was blue of a demon in my view. This poem is no longer considered doubtful as it was in 1903. Liberty has been taken to replace the book version with an earlier, perhaps more original manuscript version. End of section 66. To Isidore by Edgar Allan Poe Beneath the vine-clad eaves, whose shadows fall before thy lowly cottage door, under the lilac's tremulous leaves, within thy snowy clasped hands, the purple flowers it bore, last eve in dreams I saw thee stand, like queenly nymphs from fairyland, Enchantress of the flowery wand, Most beauteous Isidore. And when I bade the dream, Upon thy spirit flee, Thy violet eyes to me, Upturned, did overflowing seem With the deep untold delight Of love's serenity. Thy classic brow, Like lilies white and pale, As the imperial night, Upon her throne, with stars bedight, enthralled my soul to thee. Ah, ever I behold thy dreamy passionate eyes, blue as the languid skies, hung with the sunset's fringe of gold. Now strangely clear thine image grows, and olden memories are startled from their long repose, like shadows on the silent snows, when suddenly the night wind blows, where quiet moonlight lies. Like music heard in dreams, like strains of harps unknown, of birds forever flown, audible as the voice of streams that murmur in some leafy dell, I hear thy gentlest tone, and silence cometh with her spell, like that which on my tongue doth dwell, when tremulous in dreams I tell my love to thee alone. In every valley heard, floating from tree to tree, Less beautiful to me, the music of the radiant bird, Than artless accents such as thine, whose echoes never flee. 
Ah, how for thy sweet voice I pine, For uttered in thy tones benign, Enchantress, this rude name of mine Doth seem a melody. End of section 67 To Isidore Recording by Blazely Dragon The Village Street by Edgar Allan Poe In these rapid, restless shadows once I walked at eventide, when a gentle, silent maiden walked in beauty at my side. She alone there walked beside me, all in beauty, like a bride. Pallidly the moon was shining on the dewy meadows nigh, on the silvery, silent rivers, on the mountains far and high, on the ocean's starlit waters where the winds a weary die. Slowly, silently, we wandered from the open cottage door, underneath the elm's long branches to the pavement bending o'er, underneath the mossy willow and the dying sycamore. With the myriad stars in beauty all bedight, the heavens were seen. Radiant hopes were bright around me like the light of stars serene, like the mellow midnight splendour of the night's irradiate queen. Audibly the elm leaves whispered peaceful, pleasant melodies, like the distant, murmured music of unquiet, lovely seas, while the winds were hushed in slumber in the fragrant flowers and trees. Wondrous and unwanted beauty still adorning all did seem, while I told my love in fables, neath the willows by the stream, would the heart have kept unspoken love that was its rarest dream? Instantly away we wandered in the shadowy twilight tide, she the silent, scornful maiden walking calmly at my side, with a step serene and stately, all in beauty, all in pride. Vacantly I walked beside her, on the earth mine eyes were cast, Swift and keen there came unto me bitter memories of the past, on me, like the rain in autumn, on the dead leaves cold and fast. Underneath the elms we parted by the lowly cottage door. One brief word alone was uttered, never on our lips before, and away I walked forlornly, broken-hearted evermore. Slowly, silently I loitered, Homeward in the night, alone. Sudden anguish bound my spirit That my youth had never known. Wild unrest like that which cometh When the night's first dream hath flown. Now to me the elm leaves whisper Mad, discordant melodies, And keen melodies like shadows Haunt the moaning willow trees, And the sycamores with laughter Mock me in the nightly breeze. Sad and pale the autumn moonlight through the sighing foliage streams, And each morning midnight shadow, shadow of my sorrow seems. Strive, O heart, forget thine idol, and O soul, forget thy dreams. End of section 68 The Forest Reverie by Edgar Allan Poe Tis said that when the hands of men tamed this primeval wood, and hoary trees with groans of woe, like warriors by an unknown foe, were in their strength subdued, the virgin earth gave instant birth to springs that ne'er did flow, that in the sun did rivulets run, and all around rare flowers did blow. The wild rose pale perfumed the gale, and the queenly lily adown the dale, whom the sun and the dew and the winds did woo, with the gourd and the grape luxuriant grew. So, when in tears the love of years is wasted like the snow, and the fine fibbles of its life by the rude wrong of instant strife are broken at a blow, within the heart do springs upstart, of which it doth now know, and strange sweet dreams like silent streams that from new fountains overflow, with the earlier tide of rivers glide deep in the heart whose hope has died, quenching the fires its ashes hide, its ashes, whence will spring and grow sweet flowers ere long, the rare and radiant flowers of song. Notes Of the many verses from time to time ascribed to the pen of Edgar Poe, and not including among his known writings the lines entitled Alone, have the chief claim to our notice. 
Facsimile copies of this piece had been in possession of the present editor some time previous to its publication in Scribner's Magazine for September 1875, but as proofs of the authorship claimed for it were not forthcoming, he refrained from publishing it as requested. The desired proofs have not yet been adduced, and there is, at present, nothing but internal evidence to guide us. Alone is stated to have been written by Poe in the album of a Baltimore lady, Mrs. Balderstone, question mark, on March 17th, 1829, and the facsimile given in Scribner's is alleged to be of his handwriting. If the calligraphy be Poe's, it is different in all essential respects from all the many specimens known to us, and strongly resembles that of the writer of the heading and dating of the manuscript, both of which the contributor of the poem acknowledges to have been recently added. The lines, however, if not by Poe, are the most successful imitation of his early mannerisms yet made public, and, in the opinion of one well qualified to speak, are not unworthy of the whole of the percentage claimed for them. While Edgar Poe was editor of the Broadway Journal, some lines to Isidore appeared therein, and, like several of his known pieces, bore no signature. They were at once ascribed to Poe, and in order to satisfy questioners, an editorial paragraph subsequently appeared saying that they were by A. Ide Jr. Two previous poems had appeared in the Broadway Journal over the signature of A. M. Ide, and whoever wrote them was also the author of the lines to Isidore. In order, doubtless, to give a show of variety, Poe was then publishing some of his known works in his journal over nom de plume, and as no other writings whatever can be traced to any person bearing the name of A. M. Ide, it is not impossible that the poems now republished in this collection may be by the author of The Raven. Having been published without his usual elaborate revision, Poe may have wished to hide his hasty work under an assumed name. The three pieces are included in the present collection, so the reader can judge for himself what pretensions they possess to be by the author of The Raven. End of section 69. Recording by Richie Franklin, Salt Lake City, Utah. End of the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5, by Edgar Allan Poe.